Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Stand for Fulbright Advocacy Training for 2021. I'm delighted to have you with us today and all of uh, the rest of you watching this recording uh, at your convenience. I am joined today by Sarah Donovan, my colleague from Venable. Venable is our consulting firm, and they've been doing a terrific job for years. So uh, welcome to you, Sarah. Thanks for having me, John. We are going to be chatting for uh, uh, about half an hour, giving you uh, a briefing on the adventure that you're about to experience. So I wanna thank Sarah, as well as her colleagues, Laura Naho and Chase Burgess for their support uh, throughout the year. I also wanna thank Savannah Williams, who is our uh, advocacy intern, who has been helping me to schedule all of these events. So many thanks to all that who have made this possible. All right, we'll get started. All right, I'll kick things off. Um, today, as John mentioned, we're going to be helping you um, be prepared for your virtual meetings um, with Congressional Hill staffers. And hopefully after this, you'll feel confident, like you're ready to walk in that virtual room and advocate for the things that we're talking about here today. So we'll talk about how to prepare for your advocacy meeting we're going to describe how you can tell stories, your own personal stories that will emphasize Fulbright um, as the great tool that it is to reconnect to the world and also to advance national security. And we're going to have a few slides on how to have an effective meeting and following up to make sure that you make the most of your time spent with those staffers. And then finally, we're going to discuss some of the um, updates with the program. So you feel confident in being able to explain um, the situation. If there's any questions that come up that you feel ready to talk about those and then some practical steps to, um, to remember and John's gonna handle that at the end. All right, so how do you prepare? Um, most of you, of course, already have great stories to tell. So we're trying to craft those stories in a way that advances our message. What I'd urge you to do is to go to fulbright.org toolkit and explore some resources available to you, many of which will be sent to you, but this is important for you to examine on your own. The first is our message to Congress. We'll go through what that means and the ask that we're, we're uh, requesting. Uh, there is program FAQ, so tell them more about the Fulbright program, how it works and what impact it has, both on our uh, global status and here in the United States. There are resources for you to look at for the Fulbright effect in each state. So you can click on the state that you represent and look more into that. We generally find staffers interested in that, uh, but we don't put it in their packets right away uh, because uh, we wanna stay focused on, uh, on your stories. And finally, a meeting report form that will be completed by a team leader. Uh, so all of you have been communicated with, you know who you're meeting and with whom. So one of the ways to prepare is to do some more research on your member of the house or your Senator, especially on foreign policy to get a feel for their voting record and their positions um, more generally and specific to the Fulbright and foreign policy. And of course, to prepare, just be sure that you're your camera and your Zoom link uh, work and so that you're ready to go. Let's talk a little bit about the political context that we have kind of swirling around us that'll help you figure out, like John mentioned, you wanna be prepared, feel prepared so that you know how what we're advocating for will fit into the bigger picture. So we have a new administration, we have a new Congress, we have um, some new power centers. So whereas uh, Leader Schumer was in the minority in the last Congress, he's now the majority leader. So we have kind of this, some similar, some, some familiar faces, I would say, but some um, new, new um, power players, as we like to call them. Um, you should know that the pandemic, the ongoing pandemic and infrastructure, and we put that in quotes because infrastructure means different things to different people, are really the priorities of both Congress and the administration right now. That is the focus. Um, the White House is laser focused on um, the pandemic, relief efforts around that. Um, and 
they have started to turn their attention now more towards infrastructure. So that's going to be the next big thing that we're all going to be trying to um, figure out how we fit into and also talk to people about. President Biden's foreign policy has um, has is a little different than um, President Trump's. Uh, they have different focuses, but he had an interesting quote recently, and he said he wanted to restore America's leadership in the world, rebuild alliances, and counter authoritarianism. I'm obviously changing the tense here. You can see the quote on the page here. So that gives you an idea of how the, uh, the White House is thinking about the context of where the Fulbright Association is and, and the Fulbright program are sort of operating. And um, it's a big, it's a big uh, team that he needs to fill out. So the foreign policy um, professionals throughout the administration, throughout the foreign service, they're still a work in progress. So we do have a secretary in place, but all those um, political appointees, the thousands of political appointees are still working through that. So we're still a little early in that. And of course, always every year we have to fund the government and the appropriations process, despite all these things swirling around new administration, infrastructure, COVID-19, we still have to fund the government. So our appropriations process is ongoing. Um, and that's a good thing. Uh, so we always have an opportunity to be a part of the conversation about the Fulbright program, funding it um, to the extent that it's possible and um, it makes it so we have um, an opportunity to go and talk to the Hill about the things that are important to us. So we're in the middle of appropriations right now. Congress is collecting requests from members and from outside stakeholders like us. And so we're right, we're right where we're supposed to be in terms of timing and talking to congressional staff. Before I go on, I just want to uh, remind all of the, you that you're welcome to ask questions. We'll be taking questions at the end. And because this is a webinar uh, system, you'll be putting that in the Q&A part of the Zoom link. So we'll get to those at the end. Uh, please go ahead and put those questions in now, but we'll get to them then. Okay, let's get to it. Um, uh, we wanna review with you our ask. So we are requesting a, uh, from the United States Congress, a $300 million for the Fulbright program. This is a $26 million boost over the current fiscal year number of $274 million. That's almost a 10% increase, so it's a significant ask. Uh, this increase in funding would, as this uh, slide suggests, reaffirm the U.S. as a partner to 165 countries. So Fulbright is a very powerful tool for, to show the, uh, the world that we are working together, we are collaborative, we are partners in in progress. The second is to restore leadership. So there are other players in the global context. Of course, China is probably the most important. There are other countries that fund exchange programs. It's important that we compete with these and therefore an increase in funding would help us be more competitive. Strengthen our critical alliances. Many of you already know that other countries contribute to the Fulbright program roughly another $100 million, which is quite significant, and many staffers either forget that or don't know it. Uh, if we were to increase our funding, those alliances would understand that we have skin in the game as well. Uh, and then finally, widen the global reach of Fulbrighters. Obviously, uh, the priority here is to increase the number of Fulbrighters going worldwide, both outbound and inbound, and that increases the impact proportionally. So how can we get to a place with these congressional staffers where they're ready to not only hear our ask, and we call it that because that's our request. So um, John and I will be sprinkling a little bit of DC verbiage throughout this, but that's really, you know, the ask is what, what's our request? What are we coming to them with? And so how do we tell our story in order to support that message and to support that ask so that they're receptive to it? And in fact, may become a champion of it and, and make that request on our behalf. Um, so our overarching message is Fulbright is an effective investment for America, just as John described on the previous slide. And they, it, it is that effective investment because it strengthens national security by building goodwill and respect in 165 countries around the globe. It brings financial and educational resources to communities across America. These are the Fulbrighters coming in. And it also has a lasting net, lasting impact, their network of all of you. 
the, the 400,000 alumni that are worldwide. So the trick here and the challenge is to tell stories that illustrate these three points. And specifically, you may want to think about what ways did, while you were a Fulbrighter overseas, did you help to build goodwill and respect? That's an, so telling the story of relationships that you built, successful projects that you had, folks that were uh, grateful for your engagement and involvement, that's a good story to tell. What impact have you seen here in the United States? Institution that you represent where there are inbound Fulbrighters and they have benefited your community or your institution. For example, you could tell the story of a colleague of yours on the faculty who worked with you on a particular research project or taught a critical language. Number three, what specific ways has Fulbright had an impact on your life and career? The idea, of course, is that Fulbright invests in you, and therefore there's a payoff year after year after year. So telling a little bit of a story about directly how Fulbright affected your life and your career can be quite powerful. And finally, how have you maintained your network that you started as a Fulbrighter? Part of the argument for the Fulbright program is that it creates this connection among professionals and people of goodwill. So go ahead and illustrate that. Tell a quick story about uh, a group of people that you've st stayed in touch with ever since you were in Sweden or Indonesia or Brazil. And so continuing on what John started to describe, what are some other benefits? These ones that I'm going to describe are national security and diplomatic benefits. Fulbright builds strategic relationships with friends, allies, and trade partners. And of course, this is critical to reconnecting post-pandemic. We've all been very isolated. For the most part, global travel has stopped. Um, there's been a lot of interruptions in the way that we all interact, not just you know, domestically, but internationally. So this can be a critical tool in reopening those channels. U.S. ambassadors consider Fulbright a crucial diplomatic tool. And so this is very important. Um, you're part of the core that goes out and advocates on behalf of the U.S., even if it's in a different way. Um, the program develops U.S. friendly leaders, things like, you know, people like heads of state or ministers. And there's numerous examples that I'm sure John has talked to all of you about and you're aware of because of your alumni network. Um, and of course, visiting Fulbrighters teach critical languages. And by that, we mean Arabic, Farsi, Mandarin, and others, so that we can have this global exchange of not only ideas, but also languages. All right, let's talk about the meeting itself. So you go on to Zoom, you will wanna get on board a couple minutes early so that you're sure that you're connected, everything's working fine, your camera is on, you're unmuted, you're good to go. Your team leader will, orchestrate this, uh, this meeting. You'll start with introductions. So who are you? Where do you live? Now, if you used to live in this state of question, then point that out. If you're now living there, that's great. Uh, what did you do uh, and where did you go as a Fulbrighter? Uh, and just quickly in passing, mention that you're there representing the Fulbright Association. That's important because they can understand that you're in dependent from the program itself, and your voice uh, means all that more. And then, of course, you want to start with thanking them for their support of the Fulbright program. This is worth doing regardless of what record they have on this specific matter. The fact is that Fulbright funding is always embedded into other funding, and so it's a little complicated to give everybody credit, but it's, it's always a good idea just to thank them and their boss for their, uh, their support regardless of what, what their actual record is. Yeah, flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> so that's always a good, it's good meeting hygiene. Um, of course, we want to ask them to support funding Fulbright at 300 million for fiscal year 22. And that is an increase of, as John mentioned earlier, 26 million over this current fiscal year. So you can use the ask document um, and that helps you outline the rationale. Don't be afraid to reference these materials during your meeting. You know, we're not robots here and we can't have all the information in our brains at all the time. So feel free to reference the document and you can um, point out the documents of, uh, to the staffer so they make sure that they have what they need. Um, 
and you should, uh, the leader of your group should have this ready for a share screen. And important to note, I mean, we are gonna talk more about this funding um, concept, um, this increase, but the reality is that Fulbright has not received an increase in many years. And there's been inflation, um, obviously, across the, across the globe, so the dollar doesn't go as, as far, and things cost more. So it allows us to compensate for that um, somewhat, in addition to possibly expanding the program. So whatever sort of rationale you're comfortable with, use the ask document as your guide, feel free to sort of talk about this and um, to the extent that you're comfortable. Also, as we mentioned before, tell your personal stories. These are very powerful and it really helps to drive home um, and make more personal these, uh, the, the requests that we're making of these staffers. They can understand the impact that it's going to have on people. Um, and this is the primary value, of course, that you bring to the meeting is your experience and your story. So don't be afraid to really lean into that. And then, of course, you can share the FAQs as you need. Um, and again, the leader can be ready to put these up on the screen. And these are part, these, these documents are an important part of the process because we call them leave behinds back when we were in person. But you literally left these documents behind with the staffer. So as they go back to their desk, they have all the documents, all the justification they need for the request. So as they evaluate it, they can justify it to their own boss, which is the member of Congress, and then further down the chain. So these are actually really useful tools, not only for us as advocates, but also for the staffers themselves. I'll make this point a couple of times, but the ask and the FAQs are both in the toolkit. So you can look at them right now. You'll also, as I'll mention later, be getting that in an email so that you have a copy of yourself. And of course, the staffers themselves will be have been sent these two documents so everyone should have them in front of them okay let's talk about some ways to make this a successful uh, experience it's a little weird to do this by zoom i will concede that point it's always been nicer to work with people in person but this uh, digital connection is allowing many of you to participate when you haven't been able to travel to washington you don't have the expense it's just a half an hour of your time uh, and many of you, of course, have experience with Zoom, like we're doing right now. Uh, and you'll be able to see each other's faces, which will allow you to orchestrate this a little bit more effectively than a conference call might. Okay, so how do you do this? Keep your roles clear. It's very important that the team leaders who have all been designated for your teams facilitate this. Try to keep things crisp and moving along. They they basically ask people to introduce themselves. Okay, John, okay, Sarah, why don't you tell your story about this? Making sure that people know when to speak. All of you need to know, of course, not to ramble on and on, but the, or the leader can orchestrate this. Second point is keep this very positive. This is a positive experience and a nonpartisan one. These staffers, regardless of their partisan affiliation, will welcome stories from you. This is a non-conflictual issue. This is one where both parties celebrate the fact they can work together and agree on something. So go with that. That's a great feeling that you should take advantage of. Keep it short, as I just mentioned. Make your, think about the story you want to tell. You might even rehearse it in a way as to keep it crisp, to get to your point, without spending five or 10 minutes at it, which is of course far too long. And of course, stay on camera and remember you're on. These are some of the obvious things from Zoom. Does your mic work? Are you, is your mute off? Let's not do that. Oh my God, my mute is on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this happened a hundred times to all of us, but try yeah. to keep that in mind. And, as, and re remember and take a look at what you're seeing. So is the background clear? Can they see your face? Um, are you, are you, have you positioned your camera in a way that's flattering? Let's talk about some of these take home messages. You, you yourself are the proof that Fulbright is a good investment in America. So you're the real asset here and don't discount what it is that you're bringing to the table. I know it can be perhaps a little intimidating to be talking to, um, these Hill staffers because, you know, there's, you're short on time. You feel like they have a lot on their plates. And the reality is, is that they, this is part of their job and they're happy to hear from you and they want to hear from you because they want to make sure that they're doing their job the best they can. And how can they do that if they don't have the information they need for the requests that come in? 
people where it has a very positive impact on the world. And it continues um, for the lifetime that each one of you and each one of the international inbounders um, is a lot. I mean, this is a lifelong thing. So um, this, these are very, you know, this is another reason why you are an essential component to this advocacy work. And the last one is the payoff for American taxpayer is stronger alliances, worldwide goodwill, and an appreciation of American values. And um, that those, those things in themselves are worthy um, of investments um, of these appropriations dollars. Okay, as you end the meeting, well, you've had all these great stories, you've had a really great set of questions from them, you've done your best to answer them. If you don't know how to answer them, that's fine. You could tell them, write down those questions, send those to in uh, advocacy at fulbright.org so that we can answer them for you. Um, of course, you'll want to thank them for their time and attention. One of the things we always suggest our advocates do is thank them personally for their service. It's always easy to thank them for, ta for taking that time, but it's that extra little bit where we recognize these people, often young people who give up everything they have, uh, crazy hours, no, no life, uh, in order to serve all of us. Thank them for that. That's worth doing. And of course, tell them that you appreciate the support, their support, and that of their boss for the Fulbright program. So here, John, do you want me to take this one too? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sure. So after your meeting, these are some things that you can do in order to have an amplifying effect of your meeting. So you had the meeting, you talked to the ask, you, you made the connection and you submitted the, um, you submitted the request. So what can you do to really make sure that you make the most of this? Leaders should submit the form, the meeting request form that's on the toolkit website. That's helps memorialize what occurred during the meeting and to make sure that any, any follow-up that's needed is done. Um, you can post to social media and you can include these hashtags um, that are in the presentation to also do, an, you know, to, to, to compound the message. You can um, use the member or the senator's hashtag and you can share that with the Fulbright Association office. You know, this is kind of like a public thank you um, that, that, you know, of course, members always like to have that, especially for programs like this. And of course, you can write to the member of staff. And we do suggest you do that, especially the staff, and thank them. You can CC advocacy at fulbright.org and do this as quickly as possible. Oftentimes it makes sense, you know, as I wrap up a meeting myself, um, I will write up my note, um, any follow-up that's needed, attach it, or just to say thank you if there's no follow-up needed and send it along. That way you don't forget and it's still fresh in everyone's mind. Um, and it's okay if more than one person sends a note of thank you, but I can't tell you how much those thank you notes, how far they go. Um, just in not only, of course, being polite, but also reinforcing um, the messages that you delivered during the meeting. This should be a little easier this time because you're not running around trying to go to the next meeting. You're not uh, exhausted running all over Capitol Hill. And most of you have only one appointment. Uh, and therefore, uh, we appreciate you getting on this uh, right afterwards. Okay, I'm going to uh, lead the discussion uh, for a couple of these slides to talk about the context for um, these, these conversations. Now, it's important to know that uh, the things that I'm about to share with you may not come up in the conversation. This is really something you can have in your back pocket so that you have a way to answer questions that, that arise. Um, but it is pretty predictable uh, and this has happened in the conversations that I've had, it, for example, very recently with Richard Shelby's office, where well, basically their first question is, what's going on with the program right now? Because obviously international uh, uh, exchanges and travel are very difficult to do. Well, here are some things uh, that, that you can say. First of all, the program was suspended last March, uh, so about a year ago. Um, but even when that happened, which basically meant uh, all Americans were invited to come home, not all of them did. And commissions had the, this, uh, a great deal of discretion in how they managed that particular set of situations. Now, 
State Department wanted them to send their people home and most comply, but there was a little bit of wiggle room. And a number of programs have made uh, a lot of progress, uh, even under these extraordinary circumstances. So you can tell them, these staff members, that the program may have been suspended, but it's still doing its job as best it can under, ex under these pandemic conditions. Right now, participation is limited, but it is ongoing between the US and many countries overseas. For example, there's been a resumption of the program in Taiwan, which has taken on a lot of uh, the um, uh, efforts and, and personalities who had been kicked out of the China program, which I'll get to more in a minute. South Korea and Thailand have also uh, started resuming uh, their programs. This, these are not the only ones who have, these are just some examples, but there are some that have not. So in Japan, Australia, New Zealand, these have remained closed to the Fulbright, uh, to Fulbrighters, uh, largely, of course, uh, to respect uh, local and national policies regarding the shutdown. Inbound students, uh, in other words, from other countries to the United States, have been coming from many countries in the Western Hemisphere, although not from Brazil. All of you know that Brazil has been experiencing some pretty severe COVID conditions. Uh, many uh, Fulbrighters continue to participate virtually, um, and the teacher uh, exchange program has had inbound, um, inbound participants. So as you know, the Fulbright program is a lot of different programs, and they tend to be handling it a little bit differently depending on who they are. Again, the main narrative here is that the staffers should understand that the Fulbright program is in progress. It's not completely shut down. That is not what you want to uh, uh, suggest to them. And uh, of course, uh, there is a great deal of hope that, the pro that most programs will resume this fall. Uh, many of us are lucky to get vaccines. We're hoping that our friends and colleagues overseas will have the same experience. And then a lot of participants have been given deferrals so that they can restart. So this is, there is, there is a lot going on. Um, and that is the basic message that you should, uh, that you should communicate. Okay, a couple of uh, uh, quick notes on China. Now we've noted that the, the strategically, the Fulbright program can be very helpful in advancing US interests in China. Uh, we've made the argument uh, that the United States needs to do more investing, more like the way that ch the Chinese do. But it's, this has become a very complicated argument. Uh, as I mentioned in this first bullet point, there has been anti-Asian uh, violence here in the United States, which is very serious and very concerning. A lot of anti-Asian rhetoric. This is, so we have to be very careful in using China as an argument we have to be respectful and, and, and pointed, but do keep in mind that uh, there are some complexities to this in terms of messaging. It's also important to note that the previous administration ended the program in China, and that is something we would like to see reversed. That's because education and, and exchanges are important uh, opportunities to advance U.S.-China relations, all right? So this is a positive way to move forward. And if you just close a program or fail to invest in it, you're going nowhere. Uh, finally, it's important to know that the Chinese investment is, is in their own exchange programs is creating obligation and goodwill with a growing number of alumni that they have funded. We want to compete for that goodwill. Um, so the point is that the Chinese government has has borrowed this playbook developed by the Fulbright program and other exchange programs, and they are investing at an extraordinary rate. We need to catch up. And I'm giving you some numbers here that uh, a large number of inbound students have gone to China, exceeding those uh, pre-COVID that have come into the United States. And therefore, the numbers are not looking particularly promising for Fulbright. Okay, last two slides, and then Sarah and I will gladly take your questions. Um, so these are just some practical steps uh, for the from now and through 
your meeting. So tomorrow, we hope to get to each one of you. Uh, each team will receive an email packet. And in that packet, you'll find these things. A reminder of the time and the name and position of the person that you're going to meet with so that you know you're meeting with David Thompson, for example. Uh, and uh, therefore, you'll know uh, a little bit about that person. And, and, uh, and of course, remember when you're supposed to show up. There'll be a link to your specific Zoom meeting. Obviously, all of you have used this link to get to this workshop. There's a second tailored Zoom link just for your meeting, and that will be included in this email packet. There'll be as attachments the PDFs of the ask and the FAQs that Sarah and I have been referring to. But as we mentioned, they're also available on the in the toolkit. So you can look at them right now. There'll be a list of team members. Um, teams vary in size. Uh, there's as many as four or five people on a team. There's also just one or two people on a team. You'll get to know who those people are. Um, there, we will provide with to you also a digital background that has the FA logo on it. You do not have to use this. It's just fine if you don't. Sarah and I are not using uh, a background right now. Um, so if your background is, is perfectly fine, then leave it alone, but that's just a resource for you. And finally, there'll be a link to a recording of this training session, as well as the slide deck that we've been talking through. I promise the last slide, and then we'll go to your questions. Uh, okay, so what do team leaders do? Team leaders should be reaching out to the rest of the team. It's a good idea to touch base with each other in advance. Now, normally we would have done this during a regular advocacy thing where you would have met in the hall. Oh, hi, I'm John, I'm Sarah, et cetera. Um, and quickly coordinate your, uh, your storytelling. Here, there's no opportunity for that. So you have to make up for that by connecting to each other through email. I suggest that you schedule on your own, my office is not going to orchestrate this, a conversation you might have. Um, that might be by connecting through your phone, just make using the conference uh, features on your, on your phone or set up your own Zoom or a quick exchange of emails should do well enough. Be sure that you're on the call a little early. Again, be ready, cameras on, mute off, ready to go. Uh, you wanna dive right into this. These people are very busy and you wanna get their attention, hold it for 20 to 25 minutes and you're good to go. Have your materials ready. So on your screen, you should have those FAQs and the ask that we talked about. Leaders should be ready to share their screen in case the staffer needs to take a look at it. We are sending it to them, but they might have misplaced it. Um, and finally, if you have any issues, confusion, you wonder what's going on, you can direct your questions to advocacy at fulbright.org. Savannah is looking at that, um, uh, at that email site. She'll answer your questions. Also pay attention to your email because it's possible that while we have confirmed all of these meetings, they may have to move. I, have, I was scheduled for a call uh, this morning at 11. That was moved to tomorrow at 11.30. This may wreak havoc with your schedule. And if you can't participate at a new time, that's fine. Don't, don't feel bad. Just let us know uh, if it has been moved. Okay, so we'll try to stay in touch between now and uh, the time of the, of the call. Okay, so Sarah and I are going to now um, take questions. I'm going to stop sharing this screen and we'll go right to the Q&A. Okay, so let's see. Um, Let's start with Peter's question. Will the Fulbright Teacher Exchange Program be funded? Yes, it will be at a reduced level. We're, we're pleased that the teacher exchange uh, has been, it's apparently revived. Um, it, uh, we have not gotten full understanding of this, but it is very promising. Okay, Ann Lewis asked this question. Uh, we refer to 49 critical alliances but the Fulbright program is in 165 countries. 
Is this binational commissions only? Why not all? So when we're referring to the 49, and we're talking about those commission countries, those countries that uh, uh, tend to contribute financially, and, and that makes it essential. It's also worth remembering that about 80% of Fulbrighters are involved in the program through those 49 countries. Um, that does not diminish the importance of the uh, more than 100 countries that are run through the embassies. But what we're trying to do when we talk about those commission countries is to say other countries have a skin in the game. They are involved, they are, they are engaged, and they're financially supportive. And that's very, very unusual. Um, Sarah, can you see this question from Matthew? I can. So will the team leader handle the specifics of the ask? He brought up that it could get repetitive if everyone on the call asks for the 300 million. So I would say that you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily repetitive because you're just really bringing it home. Um, so yes, of course, the team leader or whomever you all designate when you talk can make the initial request, but really all your stories and everything you're doing during that meeting are supporting that. So at any point in time, you can reference that and just say, and this is why it's important that Congress fund the request at its full amount or something like that. So I wouldn't be too worried if it comes up more than once because you wanna make sure you raise it at the beginning so they know what it is you're asking for, but then also make sure that you reference it at least one more time before you close to really drive it home. One practical thing uh, Anne asked is do staffers get the documents? Yes, we will send those to them in advance, not hard copies, but they'll get it digitally. Uh, Fernando uh, asked the question about funding for the coming year. It is certainly the case, Fernando, that you could make the, it would appear that uh, because of the challenges of exchanges and limited travel, that interest in the program would be depressed. In fact, it has been the very opposite. The number of people applying to the Fulbright has actually skyrocketed. And a lot of the commissions are dealing with uh, a lot of very active, creative programming. Uh, and that's, that's exciting to see. A lot of digital stuff, a lot of careful workarounds. Um, and again, the number of people who want to travel, as you might imagine, has, has gone up uh, extraordinarily. So there is a great appetite for this. No one is thinking that uh, in the long run, this will damage the program, it's time to get going. Can I add a little something, John, before you? Please. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that he raises this because it's a good point. Um, if it's closed, then why are we funding it? And wouldn't there be money left over or something like that? I, I give the analogy of our public schools. Many of them um, at the beginning of the school year were completely shut down. And that actually didn't, you know, that didn't mean that um, there was all this money sort of left over because they were closed. There was actually an increased need for funding. And Congress appreciates this because we all have additional costs because of, um, because of the pandemic, things, you know, costs that you didn't have before. Um, but it also means that these things, maybe they don't operate as they did previously, but they're still having some level of operations. And of course, those that are still overseas you know, they, they need funding as well. So I would argue that even though I could absolutely see how this um, could seem like it would be the case, it's, it's been the opposite with not just Fulbright, but with other programs that the government is funding. Um, Scott asked the question, what is the dress code? Um, that's a good question. I would say just look business, business nice. I, I don't think it's necessary to look too formal. You'll find, I think a lot of staffers are pretty casual. Most of them are working from home. There's a kind of rotational situation where some of them work in the office. Uh, most of them work at home. They're trying to, uh, to be um, safe as well. Um, uh, Sarah, here's a, another question. Um, about how long should our personal stories be? That's a, that's a good question. To give a, uh, how, how long should, you know, 30 seconds, uh, you know, 10 minutes? What, what do you think? It's hard because we're not in person, so it's really hard to read the room, um, but I would say make them very short. And the reason is because you are going to want to do introductions. You are going to want to wrap this up. Usually the meetings in the Hill would be, we budget 20 minutes. They could be a half an hour, 
Um, but you want to make sure that you get through all the information and then also leave plenty of time for dialogue. So I would make, I, as far as the number of minutes, I think it probably depends on how many people you have in your group. If you only have three people, you can probably take, you know, two minutes, you know, per person. But if you've got five people, I would keep it quite short um, and kind of just get down to basics. Hi, my name is, I went to in these years and this is what I did. And, you know, here's one great thing that came of it and kind of let the other people talk. So I think it sort of depends on how many people you have, but try to budget for 20 minutes um, meeting. And then um, that leaves plenty of time. That includes the questions, so at least plenty of time. And actually, John, that brings me, there's been some in the chat feature, there's been some questions raised. Um, and one of them was, um, you know, giving, they asked us to give the importance of asking questions and listening to the Senator or the House members thoughts on Fulbright, I would, you know, offer staff as well, um, as opposed to the participants from the Fulbright Association taking up the entire time with talking about the Fulbright. And that's a great point. And I'm really glad he raised it because we want this to be a dialogue. We want to make sure that we get in our stories, we get in our ask, but really I do, I try to do as much listening as I can during these meetings as possible, because that is often where the value is. I kind of know what I think, but I want to know what they think. So um, that's a great point. Yes, we should get in our stories, but leave plenty of time for the interaction, for that dialogue. So you really get a sense of where they're coming from. And you'll also find that uh, you'll want to be driven by their questions, right? Because some of these folks know a lot about Fulbright. And so some of the basics that you're sharing with them, they don't need. But I found that all of these people always ask really insightful questions because they have to. Uh, somebody's going to ask them soon, what did they learn from that Fulbright group? And they want to be prepared. Um, let's, let's take a couple of other questions. Um, uh, will the, what will the $26 million boost go towards? That's a very good point. So take a look at the ask document. This is a basically a justification, our rationale for the increase. And you'll see that some of the points have to, we've already gone through in this presentation. For example, widening the impact, very important. The importance of strengthening alliances by making a financial gesture. The importance of uh, um, reconnecting to the world by investing appropriately. So these are the, uh, and of course, they would say, well, what are you going to spend it on? Mostly the answer to that question is increase the number of grantees. That's the simplest way to answer that, that question. Uh, uh, Sarah, here's a question from Lonnie. Uh, where are we in the budget process? When is a Biden budget proposal expected? And how does this sort of rhythm, how do we fit into the rhythm of budgeting and appropriations? So the president's budget, which is the budget that comes out of the White House and the administration, that's sort of the opening ask, you know, from them. We usually get that anywhere from February to some years, it's late, late spring, early summer. It can be kind of anywhere in that time frame. Um, last week, the White House had said that we could see a quote unquote skinny budget this week. Um, I don't know that we'll see it. It's what day is today? Thursday. <laughs> Today's Thursday. It is. And we saw the infrastructure proposal. I don't know if we'll see that budget this week, but we should expect to see it soon. I think it'll be more high level. At the same time, on the Hill, the congressional offices are collecting requests from constituents, from stakeholders, from um, you know companies, from whomever. They're sort of in collection mode. And that's what we're doing. That's how we fit in, is we're per participating in that process. Then what they do is they have their own internal deadlines and those vary depending on the office, depending on if they're in the Senate or if they're in the House. And so they kind of collect those. And then the Appropriations Committee, and that's the committee that is in charge of the government funding, they're gonna start doing their work and evaluating those requests and putting them together and adding them to a draft bill. And that's gonna happen this spring. So after that, um, as far as a full president's budget, I think the White House has said maybe May for you know, that kind of line by line that I think we're, we usually expect. Um, but the committee process, the hearings, the markups, all that sort of thing will be like spring, kind of into early summer. And then they'll start 
really getting down, you know, down to business. Um, the goal is always to pass a budget or excuse me, not a budget, but appropriations bills. You know, there's 12 by September 30th, which is the end of our fiscal year. And of course we all, <laughs> that's not been happening <laughs> for years. Nope. <laughs> so maybe we'll have a continuing resolution, a CR, maybe we'll have some bills. I don't know the answer to that yet, but what I think is the takeaway here is they're going to fund the government somehow. And we're right in the middle of where we're supposed to be in terms of collecting of requests. We are indeed. Um, two questions from uh, Lauren Hershey. One is, uh, do we mention the role of IIE, the Institute of International Education, and by extension, other vendors and partners in the Fulbright world? I don't think so. I, I think that you want to keep this pretty clear and simple. The Fulbright environment is very complicated, as all of you well know. That's really not an important narrative to bring to this. And in, in fact, it might backfire uh, that uh, you think, well, it's complicated, it's, therefore it's wasteful. So you don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, so best to keep it simple, focused on the impact of the program and on what you know best, which is, of course, your experience. You're not really there as an expert on the Fulbright program because you're not. You're a Fulbrighter, and you bring an important constituent voice to this advocacy effort. Lauren also asked, who heads up the program in the State Department? The Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs is headed by an Assistant Secretary of State. That was Marie Royce, who, of course, like all Trump appointees, was asked to step down. At the moment, uh, there is no one in that position. Um, but uh, uh, we will, of course see as that moves forward. Let's, um, let's take some other questions. Uh, Sarah, are you seeing anything that, that uh, uh, you would like to go ahead and answer? Um, looking through here, they've multiplied as we've they been sure. talking. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know how much will be included in the Biden budget for the Fulbright program? We don't know that yet. Um, if I had to make a very educated guess, I would probably say they would flat fund it. That's sort of the default. Um, but I don't, we don't know that yet. Uh, and I doubt that we would see that in the first budget document that we expect out of the White House. I would probably expect that in the full president's budget, which we probably will see late spring to early summer. But I would say late spring is, is the optimistic one. We have, we have a kind of secret weapon, if you will. And that is that um, Tony Blinken uh, spent quite a bit of his childhood in Paris. This is a man who understands international exchange. This is who's, who's lived the international life. And his wife, Evan Ryan, was assistant secretary for educational and cultural affairs uh, under the Obama administration. And therefore, she is an advocate for Fulbright. So the Blinken family um, might, uh, might be our secret weapon. We will have to see. Um, we don't yet know. Um, Let's see, here's a good question from Jack Davis. Are we asking for the 10% increase in order to sustain the program or will the increase expand it? Sarah made reference to this. Uh, it, it is the case that the value of the program has declined because it's been flat funded for about 10 years. And so the, the, if you do the math on this, this is basically a decline of about 17% in real value. And therefore roughly a 10% won't actually restore all of that, but it will, of course, take us significantly in the right direction. It's not ideal, but it's also, it would probably also be foolish and a bit naive to make a proposal for 17%. Look, everybody's spending all this money all over the place, trillions of dollars to infrastructure. Why can't we get our share? No, we still have to be, we still have to be targeted and strategic and, uh, and appropriate. I like um, Matthew's question about business nice. And I, he said that it's tricky for him because of his job and how he's fitting this Zoom into his life. And I would say, Matthew, show up as yourself. The 100%, um, you're going to see a variety of, I mean, maybe you won't because you're only doing the meetings you're doing, but as someone that does these a lot, there's a variety on every, on every Zoom. There's someone in a hoodie. There's someone in a sport coat. There's someone that's just kind of, I mean, I just have a, you know, I've got my sneakers on and my jeans on below here. So I would say <laughs> the important thing is that you're there and I would not feel self-conscious about your appearance or your clothes. 
Um, I think it's, I'm excited that you've, you've, you've agreed to participate. I'm sure John is too. I know John is. And so I would say show up as yourself. That's, that's almost a hundred percent of this. I think it's just about, you know, being comfortable and um, respectful and that's it. It begins and ends there. You do not need to put on a suit for this. Very well put. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Joanne asked this question uh, that she has a, a relationship already with her representative about Fulbright. They already know something about it. Um, so what value are we adding here? Well, uh, probably the, the most successful thing to say is thank them. All right. So one of the things that really doesn't happen very much at all on Capitol Hill is that stakeholders and those who benefit from programs go back to those who supported them and say, look, your support made a difference. It made a difference in the world. It advanced American interests and it changed my life. I am grateful to you. That kind of feedback is always good to hear, even if you know everything there is about Fulbright. There is always something you can add to it, though, of course. There is the stories that you can add more texture and detail. I have found that even the most sophisticated uh, staffers don't really know this, this component of the hundred million coming from other countries, that it's leveraged so successfully. There is almost no other program in the federal government in which foreign nations are contributing to our own program. It's quite extraordinary. So there's always a little bit of something you can add at the very least thanking people. There was a similar one a little bit further down. Richard was saying that in October, they were advocating for 274, 274 million and then shifted the ask to 300 in January of 2020, gained a commitment from the delegation at the time. Um, so it was our, our request an extension of that um, and was it never voted on. So um, what I would say is it's great that you got that commitment. And just like we were, John was explaining, just because they agree with you in the past doesn't mean you want to go back and reinforce that and say, we're still asking for this. Thank you so much for your support last time. We hope you will again support us this time. That number, um, the, the 300 didn't make it into the, um, what was ultimately passed, um, even though there was support in Congress for that. And so even if it had, we would still go back and ask for 300. So even if we're asking for what we call flat funding, the same as before, we still wanna go in and make sure that they don't, I mean, heaven forbid they decrease it. So I would say that it's not repetitive and it's not duplicative, that it's additive. Every time you go back and talk to them, you're developing that office as a champion. And I can say that whether I'm talking to people on behalf of Fulbright Association or another client, I talk to our champions and those that already agree with us just as much as I talk to those that I'm trying to convince to really solidify their support and see what other support we can offer them. Maybe they need some additional justification to help make that request come to fruition. Um, and you can have that conversation with them um, during your meeting. Uh, a comment uh, from Hazel Blackmore, who is the director of the program in Mexico, and then a question from Bill McComas. Uh, so the, the comment from Hazel is, uh, is an important one. Um, COVID and the pandemic, of course, have created many, many challenges for the execution of the program. There are all kinds of new procedures, tests, um, quarantine periods, uh, a variety of challenges that uh, to the administration and to the actual costs of running this thing. Uh, so it is, if, if the conversation goes in the direction of how are you managing with the, with the COVID crisis, you can say it's proven to be expensive. It, it's, it, when, when you try to administer under these circumstances, it can be a challenge. Uh, 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 the question from uh, Bill is about the coordination of the ask. So it's worth noting that our, our ask was developed internally. Uh, using, uh, of course, our friends at Venable to discuss uh, the appropriateness of this, but also consulting our advocacy advisory committee. This is made up of many people from our community, including executive directors of various commissions. It is the, so our coordination with other bodies, IIE, FFSB, is more limited because we want to be comfortable with what we're doing and to express our voice. It just so happens, uh, I've checked in with IIE that our ask 
is quite similar to theirs. They're asking for 304, we're asking for 300. Our arguments are quite similar. So this is, this is a happy coincidence, if you will, uh, allowing us uh, to, or staffers, especially on appropriations, to hear similar arguments coming from different voices. It adds credibility, it adds power. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, there was a question up at the top about um, a practical question about when they advocate in person in the past, I remember us doing this, we it suggested they take a photo and post it to social media. And so I would say to Melanie and all of you, um, yes, I mean, you could take a screenshot. Um, I would, and I would ask them if, if it's okay to take a screenshot, obviously, just like you would ask them to take a photo um, and tell them why. And then, yes, I think that's appropriate to share on your social media posts. Okay, we are basically out of time. So I will uh, thank all of you again for attending. We had really terrific turnout, over 50 people on the call. So that's exciting. Of course, to my partner in crime and friend, uh, Sarah Donovan. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Um, we, uh, we had a good time and uh, uh, I think uh, we've, we've shared a lot of thoughts. So that's great. Um, once again, look for the packages that we will be sending to you, which will include all the materials you'll need, a reconfirmation of the timing. Again, we'll stay in touch if anything changes. And if you have questions or you're confused or there's a question that we were not able to get to, please send that to advocacy at fulbright.org, advocacy at fulbright.org, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, straight away. Um, once again, on behalf of the board of directors, the Fulbright community, and, uh, and Fulbrighters around the world, to be honest, uh, many thanks for your involvement in advocacy. Uh, this is so critical. It's such an important uh, role that we play, and I'm, I'm just delighted and grateful that you're doing that. The final word from you, Sarah. No, I echo everything you said. I think that it's wonderful that you want to participate. This is representative government in action, and I encourage you, uh, whether it's on this sh issue or something else that's important to you, to reach out to your senators, your congressmen, um, and let your voice be heard. They absolutely care about what you have to say, and I am so glad that you are, um, you're giving yourself a voice. Thank you again, Sarah, and thank you to all of you. Uh, all the best. Good luck. Um, have fun and uh, stand for Fulbright. Be well. <laughs>